you. Well, let's go ahead and turn to the Gospel of Mark. The Gospel of Mark, we will be in chapter 12, and I'd like to read verses 1 through 12. Mark chapter 12, and beginning with verse 1. And he began to speak to them in parables. A man planted a vineyard and put a wall around it and dug a vat under the wine press and built a tower and rented it out to vine growers and went on a journey. At the harvest time, he sent a slave to the vine growers in order to receive some of the produce of the vineyard from the vine growers. They took him and beat him and sent him away empty handed. Again, he sent to them another slave, and they wounded him in the head and treated him shamefully. And he sent another, and that one they killed, and so with many others, beating some and killing others. He had one more to send, a beloved son. He sent him last of all to them, saying, They will respect my son. But those vine growers said to one another, This is the heir, come, let us kill him and the inheritance will be ours. They took him and killed him and threw him out of the vineyard. What will the owner of the vineyard do? He will come and destroy the vine growers and will give the vineyard to others. Have you not even read the scripture, the stone which the builders rejected? This became the chief cornerstone. This came about from the Lord, and it is marvelous in our eyes. And they were seeking to seize him, and yet they feared the people, for they understood that he spoke the parable against them. And so they left him and went away. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for, again, the word that we can come and read and study together. And as always, we do ask that you would give us clarity as we study this passage. Not that we could just gain facts and understand what the text is saying, although That is obviously important, but Lord, we would love to see this scripture used to examine us and and to be used to strengthen our faith, mold us even further into the image of Christ. And so we come here today with great thankfulness that you have given to us everything pertaining to life and godliness. You have prayed that we would be sanctified and sanctified according to your truth, and you've given it to us abundantly. So thank you for this time in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Well, we are at the last part of Christ's earthly ministry. In fact, this is really the last week of his earthly ministry. For the last three, three and a half years, Christ has been ministering primarily in Galilee, but also in other areas. And he has been preaching the kingdom of God and calling on men to repent. He has been pointing out the fact that he has come to be the savior of the world, that he is indeed the son of God, and he is indeed the rightful heir to the Davidic throne. And throughout his earthly ministry, there were several things that were bearing witness of the truthfulness of Christ's claim. It's one thing to say that you're deity or you're the son of God or you're the Messiah. Many people have said that in one way, shape, or form. But Jesus had several things that bore witness of the truthfulness of his claims. First of all, he had John the Baptist. John the Baptist was raised up in the spirit and the power of Elijah. And he had recognized that Jesus is the Lamb of God that has taken away the sins of the world. John the Baptist bore witness of Jesus Christ and was even willing to go to jail and ultimately to death to be faithful in his servants of Jesus Christ. You have the scriptures that bear witness of Jesus Christ. A multitude of passages of scripture in the Old Testament prophesied about the Messiah, how he would be born, where he would be born, the nature of his ministry, and Christ fulfilled those prophecies perfectly. The miracles themselves bear witness of the truthfulness of Christ's claims. We have all kinds of charlatans today that say they can do miracles, but you know what? None of them have been able to quiet a storm with one word, raise the dead, give sight to the blind, cleanse leprosy, and the list goes on and on. And we have the witness of God himself who bore witness of his son at the baptism on the Mount of Transfiguration. 
So Jesus' earthly ministry is coming to a conclusion. We are in what is known as the Passion Week. The Passion Week began with Christ's triumphal entry into Jerusalem, and it would culminate with his death upon the cross and then obviously his burial and his resurrection. So far in the Passion Week, the main things that we've been discussing was the fact that Christ had cursed the fig tree. He was hungry and seeing his disciples were heading from Bethany into Jerusalem and he saw this fig tree and was hungry and there was no fruit on it and he cursed the fig tree and it died on the spot. But then after that, he went into the temple. He went into the temple where there were thousands and thousands and thousands of people gathered because it was Passover week and they were changing money, buying sacrificial animals, engaging in other business. And Jesus went in and he overturned the tables and he says, this house is to be a house of prayer, my father's house, a house of prayer, and you've turned it into a den of thieves. Both of those events were a picture of God's judgment upon apostate Israel. Israel was a nation chosen by God, tremendously blessed by God. He had made several covenants with them, and he had told them that if you are faithful, I will bless you. If you are not faithful, I will curse you. And almost from its beginning, Israel was characterized by its disobedience, constantly disobeying God, constantly disregarding his warnings, constantly going after idols, constantly living in their own self-righteousness. And it was coming to a head right now. And ultimately, when the people of Israel called for Christ to be crucified, so the cursing of the fig tree, the cleansing of the temple, all of that is speaking of judgment upon an apostate nation. That brings us to chapter 12 and verse 1. And the very first word in that sentence is and. And that's a small word, but it's a significant one because what it does is it connects what is now happening, what we will be looking at today, with what has just taken place in chapter 11, specifically chapter 11, verses 27 through 33. There, Jesus is walking and teaching in the temple, and he was confronted by the Sanhedrin, and that is basically the Jewish Supreme Court. It's made up of Pharisees and Sadducees, the religious leaders. They were considered to be the leaders of the nation of Israel. Their word was gold in the eyes of many people. What they said goes. They considered themselves the ultimate authority over everything related to Israel's relationship with God and their worship. They were in charge of everything that took place on temple grounds. You didn't sell anything, buy anything, engage in any business. You didn't teach. You didn't do anything without their approval. And here's Jesus coming into the temple mount and he's overturning money changers' tables. He's condemning the religious leaders. And he is teaching as one who had authority and the crowds were following him. This really is nothing new because time will not permit us to go back and look at the beginning of his ministry. But throughout his ministry, these religious leaders were becoming more and more upset with Jesus. They were jealous of his, of his popularity they were fearful in the way that he was rebuking them. They were mad because he oftentimes made them look foolish to the people. And so now that animosity is coming to a head. Passover week is here. They have heard that Jesus is in the area. They heard the people shouting hosannas. And they are concerned and they're following after him. And so they come up to Jesus and they said... By what authority are you doing these things? Basically, what they're saying is, we haven't given you this authority. You haven't talked to us. We're not authorizing you to teach. Who are you to do the things that you have done? And Jesus says, I got one question for you. You've got to answer me, and then I'll answer you. And the question was this, was the baptism of John from heaven or from men? And in giving that question, he put them in a very difficult position. Because as the text tells us, if they say, well, John the Baptist was sent by God, 
Jesus would say, then why didn't you listen to him? Why haven't you repented of your sins? Why haven't you repented of your self-righteousness? Why haven't you done that? And they didn't do that. But on the other hand, if they say, well, he's of men, they were fearful because by and large, the people of Jerusalem liked John the Baptist. They had hoped that he was preparing the way for the Messiah who would deliver them from Rome. They liked him, and so the religious leaders were afraid of incurring the wrath of the Jews. And so they're stuck. We can't say he's from heaven. We can't say he's from men. So they say something that is very foreign to them. We do not know. We don't know. And what's interesting is these men believe that they were the they were the authority on everything. In their mind, they knew everything. And here, when Jesus asked this simple question, was John the Baptist from heaven or from men? For them to say, we don't know, almost anybody there would say, well, you should. Who else would know? And yet Jesus, by the way, they knew. They knew. They weren't ignorant. They were willfully disobedient. They suppressed the truth of God in unrighteousness. Because again, it was clear that Jesus was not just some itinerant preacher who was claiming these things by his own strength. In fact, in one case, he had offered to forgive a man of his sins and the religious leader saying, you can't forgive, nobody can forgive somebody but God. And Jesus said, very good, you're right. You're absolutely right. And it's easy to say that I've forgiven somebody, but to show you that I have the authority and the power to forgive sins, I will heal this man. And he healed him on the spot. And he goes, see, who could do that but somebody empowered by God? Who could do that? Therefore, because I could do that, I can forgive him. And these men, instead of repenting, instead of listening, just every time they got together and go, he did it again. He makes us look stupid. He condemns us. How will we kill him? How will we kill him? And so in relationship to this question asked about John the Baptist, Jesus is basically saying, listen, if you guys are lacking so much discernment that you can't tell whether I'm from, John the Baptist is from God or from man, if you are so willfully ignorant, I'm not going to answer you either. Because if you won't recognize him, you will not recognize me. Well, these people, again, these religious leaders stand condemned they had a form of godliness but they had denied its power they had rejected jesus christ this battle had been going on throughout his earthly ministry in matthew chapter 23 is one of the clearest passages in the new testament where jesus is just clearly condemning these men for their own self-righteousness And he says in Matthew 23, 13, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, because you shut off the kingdom of heaven from people, for you do not enter in yourselves, nor do you allow those who are entering to go in. The Pharisees were hypocrites. They were walking around with long robes, saying long prayers, drawing attention to themselves, saying that they spoke for God, and in reality, they were rejecting God and rejecting his son, rejecting the Messiah very religious very religious but they were in absolute opposition to god and what he was doing through christ matthew 23 and verse 15 woe to you scribes and pharisees hypocrites because you travel around on sea and land to make one proselyte one convert and when he becomes one you make him twice as much a son of hell as yourselves Well, he's not, Jesus is going to win a lot of friends when he does that. But he was speaking the truth. And then finally, in verse 33 of that same chapter, you serpents, you brood of vipers, how will you escape the sentence of hell? Jesus' confrontation of these men was very strong because they had assumed these positions of leadership within the nation. They claimed to speak for God. They claimed to be the authority on all things concerning Judaism and yet they were rejecting the truth of God's word and his Messiah the son of God they were rejecting it and they were instead just comforted in their own self-righteousness 
And in doing that, they were leading the nation of Israel astray. They were leading them away from God, away from salvation. And so the sternest rebukes of Jesus comes for these religious leaders. All of that to say that as the confrontation with the religious leaders comes to a head, Jesus is going to teach a parable. Some parables are kind of a challenge when you read through them to understand the significance of those parables. Some are just challenging. Not this one. This one is very, very easy to comprehend. In fact, the interpretation is given in verse 12. You could read to verse 12 and and there's the conclusion, there's the application, there's the understanding of this parable. It's very simple. He is condemning the religious leaders of the Jewish people for their hypocrisy and the way that they are leading the people astray. In Luke chapter 20 and verse 9, we are told he began to tell the people the parable. He's still up in the temple area. There's a massive amount, thousands of people around. Many are following after him. And in essence, he is teaching the people after this confrontation with the Pharisees, knowing that the religious leaders haven't just gone away. They're still hovering around. They're still listening to Jesus. They're still conspiring among themselves as to what they're going to do. And so Jesus is speaking to the people, but he knows these men are listening. He knows they're listening. And he began to speak to them in parables. A man planted a vineyard and put a wall around it, and dug a vat under the wine press and built a tower and rented it out to the vine growers and went on a journey. This parable is very detailed, very specific, and I believe that as we look at the rest of Scripture, it's very easy to understand. For example, the man planting the vineyard in this case is God the Father. God the Father. Turn with me, if you would, to Isaiah chapter 5, verses 1 and 2. Isaiah chapter 5, verses 1 and 2. In Isaiah chapter 5, beginning with verse 1, let me sing now for my well-beloved a song of my beloved concerning his vineyard. My well-beloved had a vineyard on a fertile hill. He dug it all around, removed its stones, and planted it with the choicest vine. And he built a tower in the middle of it and also hewed out a wine vat in it. Then he expected it to produce good grapes, but it produced only worthless ones. When you compare the parable given by Jesus with this, I think it becomes clear that this is speaking of God the Father and the work that he has done to provide for his chosen nation, the people of Israel. That's backed up as you look down in verse 7 of Isaiah 5. For the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel. So right there, it's the vineyard of the Lord of hosts. It's the house of Israel. And the men of Judah, his delightful plant. Thus he looked for justice, but behold, bloodshed. For righteousness, but behold, a cry of distress. And so the picture of this, this owner is that he gets this plot of land, and then he plants a vineyard. And that would have been extensive. That would have been involving a lot of work. He's removing rocks. He's, he's tilling the soil. He's planting the vines, nurturing the vines. He's doing all of that to plant this vineyard. He then puts a wall around it. And that wall would have been stones that he had taken out of the ground as he was preparing to plant the vines. He would have taken these stones and then circled the vineyard with all of these stones making a rock wall. Oftentimes they would have taken thorns and briars and put it on top, almost like barbed wire, to keep animals from getting in and eating the produce and even protecting it to a degree from thieves who would like to come in and steal some of the produce. A vat was dug under the wine press in which they would take the, the fruit of the vines, the grapes, and they would stomp them, and they would produce the, the wine, the juice that would flow from that. And then he had a tower that was built, and that tower was meant to be a, kind of a watchtower where a servant could go up there and keep an eye out for animals that might try to get in, uh, those who might try to come in and steal some of the grapes. 
It would be a place where the servants could retreat and find rest from a hot sun or from rain if they needed some to get away. It would be a place where they would oftentimes keep their tools that the servants used. All of that to say is that it is God who is providing for the people of Israel all of these details, all of this, the planting of the vineyard, the wall around it, the vat and the tower. In fact, in Isaiah chapter 5 and verse 4, the first part of verse 4, after telling us about that, he says, what more, was there for, uh, what more was there to do for my vineyard that I have not done in it? And again, when you go back to Isaiah, in essence, what he is saying to the people of Israel is, what more could I have done for you? I called you when you weren't even a nation. I established you. When you were in the Egyptian captivity, I delivered you. I parted the Red Sea. I gave you the law. When you were in the wilderness, I fed you with manna. I gave you water from the rock. When you went into the promised land, I promised to be with you and to protect you. I've done everything I can do for you because I love you and because I'm caring for you. What more could I have done? And after establishing the vineyard, going back to the parable, he rented it out to the vine growers and went on a journey. The vine growers were those who would have been, you know, basically tenant farmers. They would have come in and taken the responsibility of tending the land, raising the crops, harvesting the crops, producing the fruit. They would have been able to do that. And in this parable, they are equivalent to the religious leaders of the nation of Israel the religious leaders of the nation of Israel. The, the nation of Israel wasn't theirs. They were simply entrusted with the privilege and the responsibility of watching over these people on God's behalf, but they weren't theirs. Verse 2, at the harvest time, he sent a slave to the vine growers in order to receive some of the produce of the vineyard from the vine growers. Now, by the way, this could take up to five years between the initial agreement, the planting of the vineyard, and the receiving of the first fruits of the crop. Five years. In Leviticus chapter 19, he describes this process to us when he says, when you enter the land and plant all kinds of trees for food, then you shall count their fruit as forbidden. Three years it shall be forbidden to you, it shall not be eaten. But in the fourth year, all of its fruit shall be holy, an offering to the praise of the Lord. And in the fifth year, you are to eat of its fruit, that its yield may increase for you. I am the Lord your God. So when a vineyard was planted, they would allow three years for the vines to become well-established, for the fruit to be produced three years. Then in the fourth year, when they got the harvest, that harvest went as an offering to the Lord, thanking him for his provision. And then in the fifth year, you could start to eat of it and gain a profit from it. So in due time, the owner of the land, in accordance with any agreement he would have made, sent servants to see what kind of fruit was being produced. Verse 3 says, they took him and they beat him and they sent him away empty-handed. Now, you need to understand that as Jesus is giving this parable, he's talking to a bunch of people who make their living from the agricultural community of that day, many of them, not all of them. And anybody with any common sense, anybody listening to this would have gotten indignant, said, you've got to be kidding me. The landowner does all of this? And he hires these men, and in due time, he sends a servant to just get what is rightfully his, and these servants beat him, beat the servant, and send him away empty-handed? That's horrible. That's unjust. That is a crime. One commentator said this, this action would have shocked the sensibilities of Christ's hearers. Such wicked behavior was outrageous, 
cruelty, flagrant ingratitude, as well as an open defiance of the terms of the contract to which they had agreed. And this was the picture of how the religious leaders throughout Israel's history, let alone in Christ's day, had disregarded God by ignoring the prophets that had been sent to them for their good and for God's glory. In Judges chapter 6, you have the nation of Israel, because of its disobedience to God, is in a perpetual cycle of being oppressed by enemy nations, crying out to God for help, being graciously delivered. Quickly, they forget about God and go back to their sinful life until they're oppressed by another. And then they cry out to God and they are delivered. That's the cycle of the book of Judges. And in Judges chapter 6, Israel has been oppressed by the Midianites. And it says, The Lord sent a prophet to the sons of Israel, and he said to them, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, It was I who brought you up from Egypt and brought you out from the house of slavery. I delivered you from the hands of the Egyptians and from the hands of all your oppressors and dispossessed them before you and gave you their land. And I said to you, I am the Lord your God. You shall not fear the gods of the Amorites in whose land you live, but you have not obeyed me. You're not listening to me. You're disregarding me. Later on, when Israel fell into the Assyrian captivity, we were told, yet the Lord warned Israel and Judah through all of his prophets and every seer saying, turn from your evil ways and keep my commandments, my statutes according to all the law which I commanded your fathers and which I sent to you through my servants, the prophets. And yet the prophets were ignored. By the way, I hear people all the time saying, boy, God in the Old Testament sure seems harsh. Seems like a mean God. Seems like he's just unfair. And I go, really? Really? In the garden, God said, do not partake of this fruit. In the day you eat of it, you will die. He gave them a warning. They disobeyed. They died. And yet God said, Even in your disobedience, I will provide a redeemer who in the days to come will defeat Satan. I will provide a way for your sins to be covered over and atoned for so that you will be able to enjoy that fellowship with me. And throughout their history, he's sending prophets after prophets after prophets, and the people ignored them. Verse 4 of Mark 12 Again, he sent them another slave, and they wounded him in the head and treated him shamefully. They didn't just boot him out of the garden. The hatred for these servants who represent the owner of the vineyard is intensifying. Wounded him in the head literally means they struck him in the head, or in common vernacular, they bashed his head in. They bashed his head in. And then they treated him shamefully. They failed to show respect to the owner by mistreating the slaves he sent as his representatives. They brought shame on the slave and his owner. We see this several times in the Old Testament, but one good example, I'll just read it to you quickly, is found in 2 Samuel chapter 10, verses 4 and 5. You can write that down and look it up later, or if you want to try to get to it now, that's fine. David had sent his servants to console Hanun, who was the prince of the Amorites. His father had just died and David sent several servants and said, let him know that I'm here for him. Let him know that if I can do anything to help him, I will do that. And as the servants came, this prince had all kinds of counselors saying, do you think David really cares about you? He doesn't care about you. He's sending these men to spy in the land so that knowing your father has just died, David can now come and take over. So Hanun took David's servants and he shaved off half of their beards and cut off their garments in the middle as far as their hips and sent them away. By cutting off their beard, by cutting off their garments, You know, I mean, literally kind of giving them a mini skirt type of a look. 
He didn't kill them. He did something worse. He treated them shamefully. And in treating them shamefully, basically he's showing a contempt not just for them. He's showing a contempt for the king who sent them. David sent to meet them, and the men were greatly humiliated. That's what these servants were doing to the prophets that God had sent to them. There was one man by the name of Pashur who was a priest. He was a religious leader. And as Jeremiah was calling on the people to repent, as he was warning them of the impending Babylonian judgment, Pashur was upset. I speak for God. Who are you? Jeremiah's message stepped on his toes as well as those of the people. Pastor didn't like it, so what did he do? He had the prophet beaten and put him in stocks. Later on, they conspired, the religious leaders, to have him stoned. Then they ultimately threw him in a cistern up to his waist in mud. They showed contempt, treated him shamefully. Mark 12, 5 And he sent another. And that one they killed. So the one they threw out of the garden, the other one they bashed his head in and treated him shamefully. Now they killed him. And so with many others, beating some and killing others. The first thing you must keep in mind is what a gracious landowner this was. After the first servant was removed from the vineyard and sent away with nothing, This landowner would have had the right to contact the authorities and have gone there and have dealt seriously with these tenant farmers. And yet he sends another one. And then he sends others. And the picture here is to show his patience and his grace. In fact, if you were sitting there in the crowd with Jesus listening to this, there's almost a point where you almost get upset with a landowner. Why didn't he send the army in and destroy them? Why didn't he call the officials and have these men put to death? And the reason they're asking that is because, listen, that is God's grace and his mercy and his patience. It is something that is incomprehensible to us. And so he keeps sending them to him, and they're being killed. Jeremiah chapter 7 says, Since the day that your fathers came out of the land of Egypt until this day, I have sent you all of my servants, the prophets, daily rising and sending them. Jeremiah 26, Thus says the Lord, If you will not listen to me to walk in my law which I have set before you, to listen to the words of my servants, the prophets, whom I have been sending to you again and again, But you've not listened. Nehemiah, but they became disobedient, the people of Israel, and rebelled against you and cast your law behind their backs and killed your prophets who had admonished them so that they might return to you. And they committed great blasphemies. Jeremiah 44, I sent you all of my servants, the prophets, again and again. Oh, do not do this abominable thing which I hate. But they did not listen or incline their ears to turn from their wickedness so as not to burn sacrifices to other gods. Would we all agree that God was extremely patient with the people of Israel? Amen? Amen. Patient. Gracious. Sending them prophet after prophet after prophet after prophet. Telling the people, I love you. I have provided for you. I have been faithful to you. And in turning from me, you are rejecting the salvation that I alone can give you. You are rejecting the blessings that come from that fellowship with me. You are heading to judgment. And the religious leaders who were trusting in their own self righteousness, they didn't need Christ, they didn't need him. They were good enough. They kept killing the prophets and ignoring them. Hebrews chapter 11 says of these men who by faith conquered kingdoms, performed acts of righteousness, obtained promises, shut the mouths of lions, quenched the power of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, from weakness were made strong, became mighty in war, put foreign armies to flight. 
Women received back their dead by resurrection and others were tortured, not accepting the release so that they might obtain a better resurrection. And others experienced mockings and scourgings, yes, also chains and imprisonments. Almost to a man, these prophets were killed and shamefully treated. In Luke chapter 11, it's a parallel passage to what we're looking at here in Mark. And in condemning the Pharisees in a very clear tone, Jesus says this to them. Woe to you. You build the tombs of the prophets, and it was your fathers who killed them. So you were witnesses and approved the deeds of your fathers, because it was they who killed them, and you build their tombs. For this reason also, the wisdom of God said, I will send to them prophets and apostles, and some of them they will kill, some of them they will persecute, so that the blood of all the prophets shed since the foundation of the world may be charged against this generation. From the blood of Abel to the blood of Zechariah, who was killed between the altar and the house of God. Yes, I tell you, it shall be charged against this generation. When Stephen was stoned, and by the way, go back and read Acts chapter 7. The church is fairly young. Stephen is a deacon, and he is giving a message. And in that message, he spends the bulk of the time talking about how God has blessed the people of Israel. He's called them. He's made them a great nation. He's redeemed them from Egypt. He's provided for all of their needs. And then he says this. Which of the prophets did your fathers not persecute? They killed those who had previously announced the coming of the righteous one, whose betrayers and murderers you have now become. Not only did your fathers turn against the prophets sent to them by God for their good, but now you have rejected his son. You would think that maybe at this point these men would have said, what have we done? But instead, what did they do? What are we going to do? What are we going to do? Let's kill Stephen. And they stoned him. They killed him. But here's the turning point of this parable. If you're not there, look at Mark chapter 12 and verse 6. He had one more to send. And it's hard to put into English the emotion and the significance of that statement. It would be like him saying... I have sent all of my servants. I have sent them time and time and time again. You've beat them, stoned them, killed them, cast them out. I got one, one, one more to send to you. A beloved son. And he sent him last of all saying, they will respect my son in, in, in fact, it's as if he's saying, certainly they will respect my son. Mark chapter 1 and verse 11, at Jesus' baptism, a voice came out of the heavens. This is God the Father saying, you are my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Mark chapter 9 and verse 27, the Mount of Transfiguration. This cloud, this glory of God formed and overshadowed those who were with Jesus on the mountain. A voice came out of the cloud. This is my beloved son. Listen to him. Most of us are familiar with John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son That whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. One more passage I want you to look at. There may be others, but right here. Turn to Hebrews Hebrews chapter 1. We've been going through this in Sunday school. John's been doing a wonderful job in Hebrews. and There's just so much there. But Hebrews chapter 1. The purpose of the book of Hebrews is to show the superiority of Jesus Christ. He's superior to the law. He's superior to the prophets. He's superior to the priests. He offers himself as a superior sacrifice. But notice how this book begins. Hebrews chapter 1. God, after he spoke long ago to the fathers in the prophets, 
In many portions and in many ways in these last days, he has spoken to us in his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the world. And he is the radiance of his glory and the exact representation of his nature and upholds all things by the word of his power. And when he had made purification of sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. God had sent prophet after prophet after prophet after prophet after prophet, and the people rejected God by rejecting the prophets. People rejected God and killed the prophets. And God, in an amazing display of grace and patience and love, said, I've got one more, my beloved son. No longer am I going to speak to you through the prophets. I'm going to speak to you through my son. Mark chapter 12 and verse 7. But those vine growers said to one another, this is the heir. Let us kill him and the inheritance will be ours. In essence, this is a prophecy that Jesus is giving about something that has not yet happened but would happen within just a few days. Namely, he would be betrayed, handed over, and crucified. By the way, the law of the time stated that if the land remained unclaimed for three years, it would become the property of those who had worked it. So it seems as if these men were acting or believing as if somehow the owner was dead. How foolish. After all, he kept sending them servants, but... These men were so deluded that they actually thought that by killing the heir, they could receive the land as inheritance. What a delusion. And by the way, that's not much different than what the Pharisees were doing. We want everybody to look at us. We're the authorities, hence the long robes, the grand prayers, the displays of righteousness. We want everybody to look at us. We want everybody to bow down to us. We want everybody to listen to us. And the only thing standing in the way of that is Jesus. So let's kill him. If we kill him, that will take care of the problem. Then we'll go back to what we were doing before and we'll be just fine in our eyes. Psalm 2 talks of this kind of rebellion not just with the religious leaders but even political leaders the kings of the earth take their stand and the rulers take counsel together against the lord and against his anointing that is jesus christ saying let us tear their fetters apart and cast away their cords from us let's just be done with god let us just be done with what he has planned for us so that we can live the way we want to live john 111 says he came to his own and those who were his own did not receive him. They took him and killed him and threw him out of the vineyard. <laughs> and within a few days, he would be handed over and crucified. And in verse 9, Jesus is bringing this parable to a conclusion, and he asks a question. And this isn't a question that he's really expecting somebody to really have to dig deep and come up with an answer. This is a kind of a rhetorical question. You know what the answer is, and the question is this. What will the owner of the vineyard do? And everybody listening would have come with the same conclusion. He will destroy those wicked servants, the vine growers. He will destroy them. And he will give that vineyard off to somebody else. That's what he should do. That's what he will do. By the way, God has warned through the prophets that if they had not repented, they would face oppression. They would face judgment. He had been warning them for years and years and years and years. The people of Israel, they refused to listen. And we had the Assyrian captivity of 722 B.C. Then he sent prophets after prophet after prophet to Judah and saying, did you see what happened to your sister Israel? It's going to happen to you as well unless you repent. Unless you return to me, there will be a captivity. We don't believe you. We're going to do what we want. We'll kill the servants the prophets sent to us. And we had the Babylonian captivity. And ultimately what Jesus is talking about here is the destruction of Jerusalem in Roman, uh, by the Romans in 70 A.D. Roman 
Soldiers surrounded the city and they absolutely destroyed Jerusalem. Tore down the temple, burned it, slaughtered many, many people, took others captive. And in fact, in 70 AD, for all intents and purposes, Israel ceased to be a nation. They ceased to be a nation for all intents and purposes in 70 AD. By the way, he is now working through the church made up of Jews and Gentiles. It's through the church that we have received everything pertaining to life and godliness. It's through the church that we are now proclaiming the gospel to those who are lost. It's through the church. But God is not through with Israel yet. And that's a whole other message, but I'll just tell you this. He's not through with Israel yet because he's made promises to them that have yet to be fulfilled. But they will be fulfilled. The curses that came upon them for their disobedience, they were fulfilled literally, while the promises of blessing will also be fulfilled literally. And by the way, Israel's basically the only nation in the history of man that has ever ceased to exist and then almost 2,000 years later come back into existence. And that's, it seems to me like Israel's in the news recently. Why is that? Because between 70 AD and 1948, Israel was basically landless. It was a people without a nation, but in 1948, that nation was brought back into the land to a degree, not in its complete form. He's not through with the nation of Israel yet. God's grace and God's mercy. But now the parable's interpreted, and we'll have to go through this quickly. He says in verse 10 of Mark 12, have you not even read the scripture? I mean, again, he knows the religious leaders are listening. Listen, you guys are scholars. You supposedly know everything there is to know about the law. Have you not read this? Haven't you, haven't you read the scripture? The stone which the builders rejected, this became the chief cornerstone. The failure of the religious leaders to re respond in faith to Jesus Christ wasn't going to nullify God's work in redeeming sinful men. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. He uses now a building analogy, and now he's using that of a cornerstone. And the chief cornerstone was this block that was precisely measured out, and it was set down, and it became the measuring point for the rest of the foundation and the rest of the building. Everything was built off of this cornerstone. And so it was perfect. It was... It was it was, everything was built upon it. By the way, just throw this out. The Jews who are waiting for a time to rebuild their temple on the Temple Mount, guess what? They have a cornerstone already prepared. They paraded out there on occasion, and they said, when that opportunity comes, we already have the cornerstone. <laughs> they have the cornerstone, but they are still, by and large, rejecting the chief cornerstone, which is Jesus Christ. Acts chapter 4, verse 11 and 12, Peter's sermon he says, he is the stone, speaking of Christ, which was rejected by you, the builders, but which became the chief cornerstone. And there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven that has been given among men by which we must be saved. Jesus is referring to, or the, Paul is referring to Jesus as the chief cornerstone in Romans chapter 9 as well. Jesus is the chief cornerstone, and though you have rejected him, you are not going to stop God's plan of redemption. And in fact, look at verse 11. This is important. Look at verse 11. In the middle of this passage, speaking of their unbelief, their rejection, their ungodly treatment of the servants, the death and rejection of the Messiah, he says, this came about from the Lord. And it is marvelous in our eyes. And on one hand, you're sitting here going, how is this marvelous? How is this marvelous? Again, the rejection of Christ did not stop God's plan of redemption. Amen? Rather, God was sovereignly and graciously working through their rejection of Christ to provide that gift of salvation. Look at Acts chapter 2. This is on the day of Pentecost. This is shortly after Christ's death, burial, and resurrection and ascension. This is on the day in which the church was birthed. And Peter is talking to a primarily Jewish audience, and there are many who are watching what's going on and confused. 
And this is what he says. I love this for its clarity. Listen, try to put yourself in the position of some of these people. These are men who many of them had been there saying, crucify him, crucify him. We have no king but Caesar. But now they're listening to Peter. And this is what Peter says to them. Acts chapter 2 and verse 22. Men of Israel, listen to these words. Jesus, the Nazarene, a man attested to you by God with miracles and wonders and signs which God performed through him in your midst. Just as you yourselves know, you've seen these miracles. You were there in many occasions. You've heard about it. This man, delivered over by the predetermined plan and foreknowledge of God, you nailed to the cross by the hands of godless men and put him to death. But God raised him up again, putting an end to the agony of death since it was impossible for him to be held in its power. Verse 36, Therefore let all the house of Israel know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. What he's saying is that, listen, these people had rejected Christ. These people had handed him over to Rome. These people had cried out for his crucifixion. He was nailed to the cross. And yet, he was then buried and God raised him. And it was an evidence of the fact that those who come to him in faith will be justified. God accepted that sacrifice. We wouldn't have had the resurrection without the crucifixion. And so this is marvelous In his sight, these men are accountable for rejecting Christ, and yet it's through his death, burial, and resurrection that God saves all who come to him in faith. As we get to verse 12, I just have to shorten it up. He says at the end of this, they were seeking to seize him, and yet they feared the people, for they understood that he spoke the parable against them. And so they left him and went away. Most parables were intended to keep the truth from unbelievers. It was an act of judgment. But this parable was clearly understood by the religious leaders who were condemned by it. In fact, in Matthew chapter 20 and verse 16, they understood very clearly that Jesus was speaking of them and their response was, may it never be. They knew that they stood condemned. They wanted to seize him. They wanted to silence him. They had been seeking for a while to kill him, but they were afraid of the people. Because even at this time, the people were curious about Jesus. They liked to listen to him, and they were thinking that perhaps he will establish a kingdom and free them from Rome. And so they were afraid of taking Jesus by force They were afraid that the people would even stone them. So what's the application to this for all of us? Well, first of all, you see God and his provision. He's provided everything for life and godliness. Nation of Israel wouldn't have existed without God. And God didn't just create them and say, good luck, you're on your own. If you need something, let me know. No, he provided for them. He did everything that was necessary to ensure that they could flourish and enjoy him, glorify him, serve him forever. And yet they were constantly disobeying, disobeying, disobeying. God in his mercy and his grace kept sending servant after servant, prophet after prophet, and they were all ignored. And then finally he sent his son, his beloved son. And their response, their hardness of heart, the evil that was in their heart was seen and they said, Fine, let's kill him. And even though they had that in their heart, God's plan of redemption was not going to be thwarted by these men because Jesus is the cornerstone. He is the chief cornerstone. The church, God's plan of redemption is going to be built upon him whether the people reject him or not. And this is grand and glorious in our eyes. Because it's through that resurrection that Christ went to the cross. It's through his death upon the cross that he shed his 
perfect, sinless blood so that you and I would not have to face the death that we deserve because of our sins. And through faith in him, we can be forgiven and reconciled to God now and forever. Amen? I want you to keep in mind that, again, God's not finished with the nation of Israel. The day is going to come when God will further purge and purify the nation of Israel. There will be a remnant who will come to a saving faith, and then that remnant, as believers, will look upon him whom they've crucified, and they will weep, and they will mourn, but they will be washed in the blood of Christ, and they will be in the kingdom to serve him in righteousness. He is not finished with the nation of Israel. That's why when we watch things going on in the Mideast, you see all of these powers, all of these forces coming against Israel. I don't know what's going to happen in the near term, but I know what's going to happen in the end, and God will redeem his people through faith in Jesus Christ. There will be much suffering but he will redeem them. The other application goes for everybody here. First of all, if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, you should rejoice in God's patience towards you because now that we're saved, guess what? He's still patient. He's still gracious. We stand before him because of the finished work of Jesus Christ and I'm thankful for his patience and his grace every day. But there may be people here today who do not know, are not certain about whether they've been reconciled to God. And the sad thing is, is God has been sending prophet after prophet after prophet after prophet, pastor after pastor after pastor, godly friends, godly loved ones who have perhaps shared the gospel with you. And sometimes you'll have people over years saying, I don't need that. I'm okay. We'll see how it works out. I'll wait, and when things get rough, then I'll cry out to the God for help. What a fool you are for doing that. What you should recognize is that there's not one of us here that will guarantee that we're going to draw breath tomorrow. You should be ready, and the only way you can be ready is by humbling yourself, confessing your sins before God, turning from them in repentance to follow Jesus Christ. You have nothing to offer him but your sins, and that is fine with God. That's the way it was intended. You have nothing of any merit on your own. And I would wonder how many here have heard that message time and time again and still are rejecting it. No different than these religious leaders. And finally, one more thing that I think we should always keep in mind. You and I as believers have to be very, very careful. It would be easy at this point to sit there and look at the Pharisees and say, what a bunch of boobs. But you need to keep in mind, I need to keep in mind, that apart from God's gracious intervention in our life, I could have been walking in their shoe steps, in their footsteps. I'm no better than they are, neither are you. And even as believers, do we believe Jesus Christ is the Lord? Amen? Do we believe he's given us everything to life and godliness? Yep. How many times do we live our life disregarding the word of God, going about our own business, ignoring God? We cry out to him when we're desperate for help, but other than that, we really don't want him to intervene in our life. And we go about in our own self-righteous, blissful way, unaware of how offensive that is to a Lord who sent his son to die on the cross for our sins. This passage should humble us. It should make us very, very thankful. If you're not a believer, I pray that it would break your heart and bring you to Christ who loves you enough to send his son for your salvation. If you have any questions, let me know. I pray nobody leaves here today going, I don't know what he talked. If I confuse you today, talk to somebody else and let them clarify it. Let's go back to the word. But don't leave here today without knowing that you've been washed in the blood of the lamb, forgiven of your sins and reconciled that you leave here today rejoicing in that salvation and that you leave here saying, Lord, help me to be diligent in following you day in and day out. Help me not to be like these men who disregarded your word and went about business on our own. And let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for Jesus Christ. Thank you for this message. It's, it's not an easy one. And even though the main target, so to speak, is the religious leaders who are seeking to destroy you, there is clearly truth in this passage that is meant for each and every one of us as we learn about your mercy and your grace and your patience and recognize that we are saved because of those things. As we recognize that truly at our hearts, we're no different than these religious leaders. All men are sinners by nature indeed. 
There is none righteous, no, not one. The only thing that makes us any different is the work that you have so graciously accomplished in our life. You've opened our eyes to the glorious truths of the gospel and have drawn us to yourself in saving faith. May we who are believers walk faithfully day in and day out. Help us not to condemn the Pharisees while we ourselves ignore the word of God. And for those who are here today who aren't believers, who are unsure, I pray that today would be the day of salvation. That today they would wrestle with this text. They would see clearly your love and grace. They would see that there is salvation in no one else apart from Jesus Christ. Jesus himself said he is the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes unto the Father but through me. And I pray that today would be the day that they cry out in humble, repentant faith and follow you. Thank you, Lord. Amen.